So we built our slope finding machine. And again, I can't emphasize enough that you're going to get very little benefit from this video unless you've actually programmed your slope finding machine into the calculator and that you're following through in each of the exercises that I'm about to do. Again, let's remind ourselves briefly how our slope finding machine works. We're going to put the function that we want to find slopes at various points, we're going to put that right here in Y1. Y2 captures this notion of the slope between two points as they get closer and closer. Recall for yourself what A means and what X means in this particular context, and why it is that we're taking the difference between the function at a plus x and the function at a, and then why we're dividing it by x. And go back to that previous video if you're not understanding. Similarly, just take a moment to note why we've set up this table the way we have. Namely, as we get closer and closer to a from the left side, we're asking, does the slope settle down to a particular number? And as we're approaching, uh, our special point A from the right side is our slope getting closer and closer to settling down to one particular number. And are the slopes that are predicted from the left side and the right side the same value? With that, let's test out our slope finding machine on the following four functions. A straight line a parabola, a circle, and an absolute value function. So I invite you to work through the four examples uh, given here on the left. First, I ask that you make any predictions that you can make without using the slope finding machine for what the slope should be at this point two and three, these various points. Then I invite you to actually plug the function into y1 and set the a value as appropriate and take a look at the table and decide what the slope finding machine is suggesting about the slope at this point. I'm going to now include all of the values that we get from the slope finding machine. But again, there's very little benefit to this exercise if you don't yourself walk through using the machine uh, the, both a prediction as well as a result. All right, well, here are the results. And I'm curious to know in some sense how you did. Uh, let's, let's just talk through each of these situations for a moment. So in the first case, we gave a line and the slope of that line is one half, so it should come as no surprise that whether we tested it at a equals two, a equals three, or anywhere else, we would always get 0.5 as the prediction, okay? That's really just a way of validating that our machine, our slope finding machine works in the way that we expect it, even for a very simple function. Let's go on to the second case, this inverted parabola. Now, unless you have um, peaked ahead in calculus, there's really no way that you could have predicted that the slope would be 0.5 at a equals 2. But you could have predicted that the slope would be 0 at a equals 3. Now, why is that? Well, every parabola has a vertex. And uh, if you recall from Algebra 2, or even algebra one, the vertex is found as a negative b over 2a, where b and a are the respective coefficients in the quadratic equation that you have. And so that predicts that the vertex occurs right at x equals 3. And if you think about it, you'd expect the slope right at the top of a symmetric curve to be flat. And it does, in fact, turn out to be zero. 
Let's look at this circle case. Um, for the same reasons that I just described the parabola, we would expect that at x equals 0, or in other words, a equals 0, that I'd get a flat slope right here at the top, and that's in fact what I get. But why did I pick this point root 2? Let's just clarify that. First of all, remember where I got this formula. The formula for a circle of radius 2 is x squared plus y squared equals 2 squared. And I've just rearranged the formula to solve for y. And because I get both a plus and a minus in that, I've chosen the positive root, which should tell me about the, which should give me the formula for this circle in the upper half of the plane. Now, why did I pick the point root 2? Well, the idea is, if we've got a slope of 0 up here, our slope all the way out here at x equals 2 should be undefined. And right at the midpoint, namely, if you will, if you'll pardon the illusion, right at the 45 degree point, we ought to get a slope of negative 1, just by an argument in symmetry. And so finding that 45 degree point, so to speak, it's really, since this radius is 2 and 45 degrees shows me that I've got an isosceles uh, triangle, this x value has to be root 2 and the y value has to be root 2. So that's why I knew to plug in root 2. At any rate, the point was, even in a, uh, a complicated curve, uh, we can see that our slope finding machine gives us the expected result. Now this last one I think is particularly interesting where we're working with the absolute value of x. So when we picked a point out here, let's call that the a equals 2, or in other words x equals 2 point, it should come as no surprise that we got a slope of 1. Correspondingly, if we had chosen an x equals negative something point, we would get a slope of negative 1. What's interesting is what happens when we choose 0. And I just want to go over to the calculator to show you what that looks like. Hopefully you already did this. So I'm just going to put in the absolute value of x. Now let's run the table. Uh, let's see. Let's put in a zero for a. Store. Okay. And now let's run the table. What do we get? Well, as you approach from the left, the slope is clearly settled down to being negative one. But as you approach from the right, the slope is one. So what prediction can we make for the slope right at zero? Well, the fact that this number and this number are different, the closer and closer we get, suggests that there is no slope that we can talk about at that point. And that's really what I wanted to illustrate. Let's just think about this a little bit longer. As you head in from the right, clearly the slope is 1. As you head in from the left, clearly the slope is negative 1. But when you try to talk about what the slope would be right at this point, notice that there are any number of lines that we can draw through this point that just barely glance at the, uh, at the absolute value function. We could have a slope like that. We could have a slope like that. We could have basically any slope at all. And so we say that the slope is not defined at this point because there's no one value that it's consistently settling down to, both from the left and the right. So I actually added that last example as a kind of cautionary tale. Um, as you go about using your slope finding machine, remember, if the results coming in from the left and the results coming in from the right differ, the slope is not defined. Okay, well, 
If you've watched all of these videos to date, you'll recall that we first built our own area finding machine, and then we found out that the calculator, in fact, contains its own area finding machine, which, quite frankly, in all respects, proved faster and more accurate than anything we could build. So I hope it comes as no surprise to you that now that we've gone through this exercise of what it takes to build a slope finding machine, that you'll find that the calculator already has its own slope finding machine built into it. And that is called nDeriv. So now let's talk about how nDeriv works on your calculator. And of course, if you don't have a TI calculator, you'll need to find the corresponding name that that calculator uses. But since so many students use the TI, that's what I'm focusing on. At any rate, nDeriv takes three arguments. First, you put in the function whose slope you want to find. Then you state what your variable is. And without going into too much of a digression, you pretty much always want to put x here. Finally, you want to say where along the curve, where along this function, do I want to assess the value? And that's where you put in a. Okay. Now, others of you may have an alternative display that looks a little bit more uh, graphical. And it looks like what I've drawn here in black. And here are the corresponding locations for where you place the function, where you state the variable, and where you indicate the value that you want to evaluate the slope. But it works in either the written representation or this more symbolic representation. So let's try this out. So I'm just going to illustrate how to use the built-in slope finding machine in Deriv in uh, two cases. I'm going to use this function and show how you evaluated it too. And then I'm going to use this absolute value function and show how you evaluate it at zero. So let's go ahead with that. Um, so what I've done is I've entered two in for A. In the formula space, I've put in this function here in for y1. Note that our own slope finding formula is still here in y2, but we're no longer going to use it because we're going to use the built-in function. But now we choose math 8. Let's go back to where we were. Let's choose math 8, and you'll see that you get this in deriv. What do I put here? That's the variable. I say it's x. What do I put here? Uh, sorry, I went beyond. What do I put here? I put the function. In this case, uh, what I've stored in y1. And what point do I want to evaluate it at? Well, I want to evaluate it at the point that I've designated a. So, that's our function. We enter the result, and it gives us 0.5. Again, we don't get to see the inner calculations that it's doing the way we did when we looked at the table of our own slope finding machine, but the result is exactly the same. All right, let's switch gears and switch over to uh, this absolute value of x. Now, I'm going to show you another way to use this nDeriv function. I choose math 8. I get this function, so what am I going to plug in for the variable? I'm going to say the variable is x. Now, watch what I do here. I could just put in y1 for the function, and that's what I'd ordinarily encourage students to do. But note that we could just put the function directly in. What do I mean by that? I mean that I can just call up the function absolute value. And um, in, insert it, absolute value of x. Okay. And in a similar fashion, here I could say at the point where x equals a, but I could just plug it in directly. I could just say at the point where x equals 0. OK, now let's watch what happens. Okay, because I think you might be a little surprised. It says that the slope is 0. Now that's a major mistake. We know that the slope is not 0. We can reason that through because 
what the slope appeared to be settling down to as you approached from the left side was quite different than what it was settling down to as it appeared on the right side. This is the fundamental problem with the in derive function. It gives great results in all situations except where the slope is undefined. In that sense, our own slope finding machine is superior to what the TI engineers have built into the um, calculator. Again, with uh, our area finding machine, the program that was written for the TI was superior, I think, in every respect to our own area finding machine. But not so in these unique cases where the slope is undefined. So you can feel, take a little pride in knowing that you built something better than the TI engineers built. So what have we learned? Well, first, I, I wanted to go back just a second to emphasize something. And that is, I only showed two examples. Uh, this parabola at 2 and this absolute value function at 0. But you can go through each of the cases that we did with our own slope finding machine and get the equivalent results using in derivative. And I'd encourage you again to put in the practice that will lead to really learning this concept. Uh, so what have we learned? We learned that one, our slope finding machine gives reasonable results for a number of example curves that we worked on. Second, we learned that there is a built-in slope finding machine in Deriv, and um, in one or the other form that it presents itself on your calculator, you input into it the function, you put x for the value of the variable, and for the particular place that you want to evaluate the function, you put in the value. But one thing we did learn is that in Deriv sometimes will fail to give you the correct answer when the slope is undefined. It works fine for these um, what appear to be smooth functions, something that we'll get more technical about later, what we mean by smooth. But when it has this abrupt change in it, in Deriv fails to give us, fails to warn us that the slope doesn't exist at a, at a particular point.